Welcome to Medical Myths, Legends, and Fairy Tales. I'm your host, Dr. Alan Christensen. Look, you know that between the latest online fads and the crazy media headlines, it's easier than ever to get confused about your health. And you and I just want to feel better and live longer. We want to know what works. And we can't wait for further studies. We need to make decisions today based on the best evidence we've got. Well, that's exactly what this show is here for. So let's get to it. Hey, Dr. C here with you. So let's take a deep dive into iodine on the skin. <laughs> so iodine does absorb across the skin into your bloodstream. And some of the things you put on your skin can have substantial amounts of iodine. If you can get your whole day's iodine intake under 100 micrograms, there's a good chance your thyroid function can improve. And if it's stable, the more you can keep your iodine under 200 micrograms, the more likely it is to stay stable. So we absorb iodine in three ways. Uh, of course, from our intestinal tract, somewhere around 92, 95% of the iodine that we consume in our intestinal tract comes into our bloodstream. We also absorb it across our lungs. Is that wild or what? You've probably never heard that before. There have been studies showing that if you look at coastal areas that have these massive kelp beds, like big piles of kelp by the beach, the homes nearby there are, have higher amounts of iodine than you would predict from their intake. Some areas, you would actually think that they could be iodine deficient if they consume small amounts, but the amount they excrete is much higher. And it's been shown that we do take some in by breathing uh, it from the air. So areas that have a lot of iodine in the air, you can breathe that in as well. Now, that's just mentioned as an aside. And the question can be, does that mean I hurt my thyroid if I go to Hawaii? <laughs> the short answer is no. The amount that way could offset a borderline deficiency, but you would not be exposed to excess. That's rather unusual. But the skin is another big route. So somewhere around 4.5% of iodine that encounters healthy, intact skin will end up crossing the skin and getting into the bloodstream. Now, if your skin is not intact, if it's sore or irritated, you've got a rash, those amounts can probably be even higher. Funny thing, in the past it was wondered if skin absorption was related to iodine requirements. So some researchers thought that perhaps we would absorb more iodine across our skin if we needed more of it. And to date, there's still a popular patch test that you might hear about. And the idea is that you could take something like betadine iodine and swab some of that on your forearm, and it makes this real dark mahogany brown color. And if that color fades quickly, the thought is you must have sucked that all in because you needed it, <laughs> that you must have been iodine deficient. Well, that was studied a long time ago in the early 30s, and they painted iodine on the skin of people that were low in iodine in people that had enough iodine, and in people that were dead. <laughs> they used cadaver skin as well. And there was no rhyme or reason between those three groups. So, and, we, and now we know that, yeah, there are medications, there are hormones, there are a few nutrients. There's a lot of things that can go across our skin into our bloodstream. And there are many ways in which, examples in which our intestinal tract will adjust absorption per requirements. So iron is a good case, case in point. If we have a lot of iron in our bodies, we'll absorb very little iron from our diet and then vice versa. However, there are no mechanisms we know of by which our skin can adjust its absorption of any of these sorts of things. So, so no, the skin doesn't preferentially take up iodine when it needs it or block it when it does not. So how does this get to be relevant when you're thinking about managing your iodine? Remember that if you wanna maintain good thyroid health, you want to stay under about 200 micrograms of iodine per day. If you wish to improve your thyroid function, you want to go below roughly 100 micrograms per day. So we've seen that long-term exposure to topical iodine can cause thyroid disease. That's shown up when iodine is used as a skin antiseptic after cesarean function. Mothers that are used, given iodine on their skin, have a higher rate of thyroid problems after the procedure. We've also shown the same thing for infants. So the infants themselves that are waiting to come out, when mom gets a lot of iodine painted on her skin, they have higher rates of showing thyroid dysfunction. And we've also seen that in the past, iodine was used in hand sanitizers. And it, it works well, it's a really good antimicrobial. 
However, in one medical center, they found that 40% of the staff was at completely unsafe iodine levels, and it was attributed to the iodine hand sanitizer. So for those reasons, the FDA has banned the use of iodine antiseptics and the use of iodine in all uh, hand sanitizers, so people can't get too much of it. But where else is it from? Well, so I mentioned how iodine is a useful ingredient, and it's a nice emollient. It makes cream smooth and even, so they're, they're not lumpy. It also, it's a good preservative, it's a good antioxidant, so it's been a popular in, ingredient in cosmetics. Uh, we'll see this in personal care products from mascara, eyeliner, hair conditioners, hair sprays, skin lotions, sunscreens, shampoos. And the question is, well, but how much is there? You know, I, I spoke to a friend recently who's a skincare specialist, he's a plastic surgeon, and he said, well, but aren't those things pretty low down on the ingredient list? And I said, yep, they are, but we can run some numbers on this. So it turns out that even small amounts can be relevant. And the reason for that is because iodine is something to where its dosages are measured in the micrograms. So like a facial moisturizer, for example, if you were to take a common moisturizer, it will often have ingredients that are dense in iodine. The most common single ingredient is polyvinyl pyrrolidone, and it's also called PVP for short. So a lot of products, a lot of skin products, will have uh, anywhere from half a percent up to about 3% PVP. And PVP is about 12% iodine by weight. So if we take a facial moisturizer, uh, when you put that on, you'll commonly use about 15 mils, which is not that much. It's like half of a shot glass. That's about 15,000 micrograms. So if 3% of that 15 mils is PVP, that's not much. It's a tiny percent of the whole formula. But that's 45, 450,000 micrograms of PVP. And if PVP is 12% iodine, well, now we're down to 54,000 micrograms. And let's say we absorb 4.5%. Well, we're still left with about 2,430 micrograms of iodine. We've got about, what, 12 times the day's safe limit just in that facial application. So PVP is the main one. You'll see this by different names as well. Those can include ammonium iodide, potassium iodide, sodium iodide, iodoform, uh, PVP iodine, hydroxypropyl bis trimonium diiodide, TEA, eth iodized oil, iodyl propanol butyl carbamate, and we'll also see seaweed extracts. Uh, common names can be just that, seaweed extract or kelp extract, laminaria, fucus, things along those lines. You know, a good trick that I've done is find the manufacturer's page with the ingredients. It might be on a, a commercial shopping site if you buy things online, but if not, just go to the manufacturer's page. You can find the ingredient list somewhere and then do a search, you know, do a, a alt, alt F on that screen on your browser and put in IOD. And in most cases, if there's an IOD compound, it'll pop up with that IOD search. So that's how I start. And if I don't see that, then I scour for seaweed extracts. And the word extract is a good word to put in your search. And that's a way to save yourself some time of like reading everything in that big long paragraph of ingredients. And I've not seen this be a thing about like, you know, natural organic cosmetics versus commercial cosmetics. They can both have them in there. Now the cool thing is most do not. I've found that probably per the product category, 30 to 40 percent will have iodine ingredients. So most don't. They're really easy to work around. But if they are there, they can be a big deal. And their use alone can be just completely slowing down your thyroid function. So the extra iodine, it works in two big ways. One of which is that a, an occasional high dose can dramatically shut down the thyroid. Uh, along those lines, a recurrent moderate dose can somewhat slow the thyroid. So imagine one is like stomping on the brakes and the other is like you left the parking brake on a few clicks. So this is called the wolf chaikoff effect. And the basic idea is that the thyroid wants to not make unsafe amounts of hormone to damage your heart. 
So rather than let the iodine just go right down the conveyor belt and crank out a lot of hormone, it shuts itself off or it slows itself down. But the other way that it affects you is that the extra iodine damages the proteins of your thyroid and damages the cells and alerts your immune system and makes them think that your thyroid cells are foreign invaders, so it drives autoimmunity. So by identifying and avoiding these extra sources, you can help with all that. So where does this come down to in terms of practical steps? Well, I mentioned some products that can contain it, like mascaras and hairsprays, and let's think this through. The amount of those things, what's the actual volume of those things that you use? Well, there's not a lot. There's just like a few little specks that actually are coming out of the container. And then how much of that contacts your skin area? You know, also probably not very much. So I don't worry about those, those sorts of things. I don't worry about the, the mascaras, the eyeliners, the hairsprays. But I do think it's worth thinking about your shampoos, your conditioners, your sunscreen, your skin moisturizers, and your facial moisturizers. Uh, these are compounds in which the amount you use is substantial, and you probably use it on a daily basis. You know, we've had case studies now of women to where the only change they make was swapping out product A for product B, and that's all it took to get their thyroid function back online again, just a different, different type of conditioner. I remember uh, one woman that was hearing about this, she objected because she was really attached to, I can't remember now if that was a shampoo or that was, it was some kind of a product, and she didn't want to let, let go of that product. And I, I couldn't believe it. I was like, you know, palm to forehead. I'm like, come on, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of products in the market. I bet there's another one you could like at least as much, if not maybe a little bit better. And she was someone that had that transformation I'm describing. And she wrote back and said, I feel so bad about, you know, questioning this and delaying it. And I found a product that works better for me. And now it's, I have seen improvements in my thyroid symptoms. So that was, that was really rewarding. And yeah, it's worth the change. You know, um, another thought about topical things, one last one to think about, these aren't as common now as they were in the past, but vaginal douches. There are a lot of commercial douche formulas that do have iodine. And I mentioned how the absorption is, you know, 4.5% across intact skin. Well, the vaginal lining is mucous membranes. So that's more absorptive than exterior skin of the body is. I've not found exact numbers, but it's likely upwards of 20% or greater. So please do avoid uh, uh, vaginal douches that contain iodine. I'm not a GYN, but what I'm told is that douches in general are not a good idea. They're kind of like antibiotics for your gut. You're depleting the normal, good, protective organisms that are there, but they can also be a source. And along those lines, just the use of iodine as a skin antiseptic is not a good idea. If you do need one, there are a lot of other compounds like chlorhexidine, which are actually less harmful and just as useful. For initial exposure to a lot of skin traumas, you can do rinses of peroxide. Uh, my, my training was in the past was that you don't want to use peroxide recurrently on any damaged skin because it can delay healing. But you can use peroxide as a one-time initial application just to break down any organisms that are there in that moment. So Dr. C here with you. That was our deep dive on iodine and your skin. Hope there was something useful in there. Uh, take great care of yourself. This is, it's a really exciting time. You know, I've, I've wanted for so long to find simple answers that could help thyroid disease, and I've done my best to deliver what I can, but this is a whole new level, and it's a, it's a great thing that there are easy steps like this you can take that can clearly make a big difference based on solid evidence. So yeah, please do take it to heart and please know that your health is worth it and your thyroid function is critical to your well-being and your long-term lifespan, your risk of chronic disease. So yeah, please, please know that it, it can make a big difference. All right, take great care and we'll talk in real soon. Bye-bye. Hey, Dr. Christensen here. Thanks so much for joining me for another episode. Is there a topic you'd like me to cover? I'd love to hear from you. Just go to Dr. Alan Christensen on Facebook or Instagram, write your question, and use the hashtag medical myths. Did you find this show helpful? If so, please take a minute and leave us a rating on iTunes so that others can know. Thanks much. I'll be back with you real soon. Bye-bye.